Okay, let's get started then. Okay, so welcome everyone to this SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies um, book talk. We're really delighted to welcome Sydney Yuan, Professor of Communication at Northeastern State University. And today she's going to be talking about her award winning book, Identity Politics and Pop, um, Popular Culture in Taiwan, the Sa Jiao uh, Generation, that was published in uh, 2017. Um, I'm delighted to see that we've got quite a few SOAS students who have joined um, at today's session, particularly as uh, we also use one of her blog pieces, um, What is uh, Taiwan Identity, that was published in the SOAS uh, China Institute uh, blog. So um, many of us are familiar with uh, that piece, but also her, her book. And I'm also delighted to have checked that we do actually have the, um, uh, the e-book um, of Sydney's book in the SOAS uh, library. So if you enjoy uh, today's talk, you make sure you uh, um, um, uh, go into a little bit of uh, more detail. Um, the other thing I should say about uh, Sydney is that, uh, like many of us in the Taiwan Studies field, she's also involved um, in um, Taiwan Studies institutions. So she's uh, a member of the board of directors of the North American Taiwan Studies uh, Association, um, an association that's also had a huge impact on Taiwan studies in Europe. As many of us had our, our first Taiwan studies conference experience at NATSA. Um, um, and I know many of us are gonna be taking part in next year's uh, conference, uh, NATSA conference uh, as well. And, and we'd also welcome Sydney and, and your colleagues to come and join us at uh, the European conference in, in, the, um, uh, in the future. And I know that one of the things that's really exciting is the way that NATSA and EATS are starting to work together a lot more in um, in real and the So I'm going to hand over now to you, Sydney, and welcome to um, SOAS, and hopefully um, in the future we can um, uh, really bring you to London, not just not just online. So over to you. All right. Thank you, uh, David, for your introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's about 5 p.m. in your time. And uh, uh, my name is Sydney Yue. I'm an associate professor of communication studies at Northeastern State University. And um, it's my honor to be here to share with you about my research. Um, and I would like to especially thank Duffy for your invitation. Um, so basically, my book was published in 2017. Uh, it's, a, it's been a few years. However, I do. I do believe that the phenomenon I mentioned in my book is still powerless or vulnerable in the Taiwanese society. So um, I would like to use this opportunity to have a kind of a presentation. And I also look forward for your comments and feedback in the end. Uh, I am working on something um, extended from this book project. So I, uh, any of your comments would be very helpful. So in today's presentations, I probably will cover four aspects. First, I would like to talk about the origin of the project. Uh, how did I start to study Sajiao? And secondly, I think um, I would like to share with you some of the dominant discourses um, about the Sajiao culture or the Sajiao phenomenon. And then the third thing I would like to share is the um, uh, field work I conducted in Taiwan and uh, what I found. And uh, lastly, I think uh, I would like to connect Sajiao with the political communication or the election culture in Taiwan. And this part I, I touched a little bit in my book, but I did not do a very thorough analysis. So after I present what I found about the politician's use of acute elements, I would like to hear your input on that part. Okay, so um, let's start from my introduction of the origin of the project. Okay, so many people knew when uh, when they knew that I, I studied Sajiao, they would ask me, how did you start? Why did you want to do that? And to be frankly speaking, I did not come up with that topic when I applied for my PhD degree. Um, I was interested in gender. I was interested in popular culture in Taiwan or in East Asia. 
and maybe uh, intercultural communication, but I did not have a topic. And um, as a graduate student, you probably will feel pressured because if you do not have a topic, uh, you will uh, have a hard time, like a painful searching process, right? And uh, the worst thing is that I even switched my advisors. So um, what I did actually was, um, uh, but it's, um, do you still see the my screen? I think I lost it. I just saw a lot of uh, people participant. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll re-upload it now. See. Okay, okay, I, I can still continue my story uh, because this doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, when I am um, working or like uh, searching my dissertation topic, I just uh, keep visited my uh, professor, my new advisor. Uh, I chat with her in the office and I, all, uh, I also ask her questions, you know, did you have any project that I work with you, you know, and finally uh, she said, uh, Sydney, I was working on the collecting terms, native terms for persuasion. And uh, I would like to uh, get to know some Mandarin Chinese terms in persuasion. Could you give me some? And the three terms you saw on the screen would be the three terms I gave to my advisor. Um, the first term is a general expression of persuasion in Mandarin Chinese, qian. And then I gave her um, the a masculine form of persuasion, that is Qi. And then I gave her the third term, that is Sa Jiao. I labeled it as a feminine form of persuasion. And that was the beginning of my dissertation and the journey of studying Sa Jiao. Uh, my advisor actually asked me a lot of questions about Sa Jiao, uh, why adult women in Taiwan would like to manipulated their significant other by playing cute. Um, she could not understand as an American middle-aged woman. She thought it's weird. And so I have to answer her questions and look very professional and in dark that that could be a potential dissertation topic. And I, I, I did it, right? So the lesson for many graduate students on the spot today, maybe if you do not have any topic or thesis, that's a good strategy just to bother your advisor and then work with them and then maybe you can come up with a dissertation topic. All right, and I think um, that's the beginning, but also I think um, um, my interactions with my advisor actually plays an important role in shaping my research. So um, here is the photo of my advisor and me in my uh, graduation ceremony. I want to show this image, not just to uh, recognize her help, um, but also I want to highlight the interactions between me and her. Uh, in the process of doing my dissertation, I was f looking for a translation for Sa Jiao in English, and I couldn't find any proper term. Uh, I think the closest term probably would be playing cute. However, this term, in my opinion, did not capture the nuances or significance of Sa Jiao in the Taiwanese context. So finally, I decided that uh, maybe I just use the transliteration Sa Jiao as um, the native term to show that it's a quite unique um, Taiwanese culture. Um, and also, I think um, when I, um, originally I, I tried to do this uh, Sajiao study in terms of a gender perspective, because in the previous research, uh, Sajiao actually um, has been studied as a women's talk, women's ways of speaking, women's ways of uh, expression. However, I do believe that the interaction between me and my advisor uh, changed my thought to kind of elaborate this project from the gender perspective into a cultural perspective. Um, as I submitted my chapters to the advisor and my advisor, Christine Fitch, uh, started to get to know more about what Sajiao is. So occasionally she would 
ask me, Sydney, are you sajiaoing to me again? And I was like, what did I do? Or what did I say? Why did you say so? But after reflecting or pondering what I have done or what I have said to her, I realized maybe I, I did sajiao to her exactly. And uh, that, me, that made me wonder why I would like to, I, I performed sajiao in front of a cultural outsider, my advisor. And that aha moment made me think sajiao probably is not just about gender, but also about power relations. She's my advisor and I'm just a powerless graduate student. When I felt guilty, I didn't submit my work on time or I felt uh, less confident. I uh, just looking for a communication solution, you know, how to persuade my advisor, even though I did not reach her expectation, I still a good student, right? And that, um, um, communication pattern I'm looking for back to my cultural knowledge. Um, I think it's it's a cultural package I have. Um, I carry uh, carry with me from Taiwan to the United States. So that moment or that interactions make me think maybe I need to um, explore further what Sajiao means to um, Taiwanese or to many Mandarin uh, Chinese speakers. All right. And let's start start back to the Sajiao. Um, take control. Um, let's see if I can. Right. Can you see the screen right now? I think so. Yeah, it says, it says, <clears throat> it says Sajiao. Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, Basically, Sajiao combined two Mandarin Chinese words. The first word is a verb, and the second word is an adjective. And uh, we can see that um, the first word actually is um, um, hand movement. Uh, I did a little bit of special effect I want to show you. So basically, Sa is a, a verb hand movement, you throw things out. And Jiao basically um, shows feminine prettiness. So basically, um, we have a phrase, phrase called Ren Bi Hua Jiao, means one person is prettier than a flower. And it used to, um, it, it is used to describe um, female most of the time. Literally, so the phrase of Sa Jiao could be saying that one is showing off their feminine prettiness, okay? And in most dictionary, Chinese dictionary, you would find the term shi ai zuo tai as the explanation of sa jiao. And uh, to translate the shi ai zuo tai into English, you can find the term, um, the phrase, the expression, to deliberately act in front of someone because of the awareness of the other person's affection. So basically, uh, we could have we could elaborate two features of Sajiao from this description. First, Sajiao is relied on love and like a doll. You have to make sure that your audience actually likes you or loves you. Otherwise, your Sajiao may not work. Second, Sajiao actually means perform a pretentious gesture. Okay. So in this expression or in these two features, we do not see a lot of gender implication, right? So when I, um, before I went back to Taiwan to conduct my field work, I actually already done some uh, literature review and uh, browse all the um, Sajiao studies beforehand. And I found it's very interesting the dominant discourse in Taiwan about Sajiao actually is a quite gendered uh, explanation. So you would find that Sajiao is a necessary skill for women, and Sajiao has to be naturally performed. Moreover, um, a Sajiao character should have a certain 
body features that they should look young. They should their body should be very tiny, slender, and the such as um, female probably should have a very attractive voice. And of course, this female image should be pretty and cute. And um, so, so I found this fascinating. Why um, the Sajal discourse is all about women, and it sounds like a, Taiwanese women are uh, given a lot of a pressure that they have to be good at Sajal, and they need to know the skills so that they can be um, uh, to maintaining the relationship in a heterosexual relationship. So. Um, so when I go back, to, when I went back to Taiwan and conduct my, oh, oh, this one is a, just an example to show you. Um, in the contemporary Taiwanese society, what kind of a female image would look like a Sajiao feature? So these are the book covers from the romance novel in Taiwan. This is a very popular genre. Can tell that these women are portrayed in very innocent, cute, and pretty uh, features. And I argued in my book, this kind of a female ideal image was actually heavily influenced by the Japanese kawaii culture after the 1980s, 1990s. Um, because of this popular cultural uh, flow, um, the gender role or gender expectations in Taiwan actually have certain um, uh, salient change. Okay, now let's talk about um, some of my fi findings in Taiwan. According to Catherine Ferris, she I think she's the first figure studying Sajiao in Taiwan. She defines Sajiao as a set of actions that involve the imitation of a child's gesture, body movements, and ways of speaking. And as you can see, uh, these are some examples how people define or identify Sajiao behavior. If you do this kind of acute uh, performance, you are conducting Sajiao. All right. And also, I do not think Sajiao should be just studied as a women's speak speaking act act or facial expression or body movement because all these figures they are they are celebrities in Taiwan and all of them could perform certain Sajiao feature that is pouting right so um, Sajiao actually is an action of um, with informal feminine childish and irrational performance However, the feminine expression does not always attach to a female body. That's, I, I think that's important um, uh, contribution of my book because I, I do not deny that uh, Sajiao actually is a gendered performance. However, uh, we should apply Sajiao to an even broader uh, social phenomenon. All right, so um, basically what I did in Taiwan uh, in two summers was just, you know, walking around in Taipei uh, in a specific area. There were a lot of department stores, restaurants, um, banks, uh, parks, or on the bus. All of these public settings are the place I collect Sajiao cases. Okay, uh, so it was not very difficult for me to locate or identify Sajiao scenes in everyday communication, everyday life in Taiwan. And after I collect sufficient numbers of such case, cases, I decided I, I kind of uh, categorized their functions. So I believe that such has some uh, practical everyday communication functions. And the top three are greeting, apologizing, and negotiating. So you may ask me, how did I determine this thing is a Sajiao thing, right? Um, in previous studies uh, from Car uh, Catherine Ferris or uh, Dr. Chow, they already gave me a lot of uh, Sajiao features. So basically I used their observations, their uh, principles to ident identify those Sajiao behaviors uh, I found in Taipei. 
And uh, uh, these features include the following. OK, they are not the whole list, but these are some very salient uh, such features. For example, high pitched baby voice, or maybe you can say some nasal sound, uh, excessive usage of sentence final particles, tag questions, deliberate acute performance. So, uh, for example, I think um, the common phrase for apology in, in Mandarin Chinese would be 对不起. And if you want to add a little bit of sajiao flavor, you could use the sentence final particles um, in the 对不起 phrase. So I'm going to demonstrate a little bit. Um, I will try my best because I don't think I'm a sajiao person. But anyway, um, 对不起, if you want to add a sajiao flavor, that will sound like 对不起啦, 对不起哦, 对不起嘛. Something like that. I don't know how you feel because I cannot see any audience's face. You, if you smile or can you give me a thumbs up <laughs> to show that I did a good job? Anyway, uh, so thank you, thank you. <laughs> so so basically that expression um, I will identify as a Sajiao feature. And for the native um, Taiwanese um, Mandarin speakers, they will feel a sense of acute. OK, and another example I found very fascinating is that I observe a lot of female clerks in Taiwan would greet their customer by saying, how are you? Ni hao, with a very cute expression. So they instead of saying ni hao, they would say meow. Meow. It's just like a kitten meowing. And that kind of expression is amazing to me because I, I always feel like, wow, it's so cute. It's so, so cute to the um, Taiwan Mandarin Chinese listeners. And I do think that expression could short, shorten the distance between um, listeners and uh, speakers. And that is important element for Taiwanese. They want to express their friendliness. They want to show people that we could establish um, intimate relationships. And these features are important for Taiwanese. Taiwanese are proud of being uh, friendly. And uh, so that's that's the reason I think um, Sajiao culture is very prevalent in Taiwan nowadays. And um, um, so after my literature review and my uh, field work in Taiwan, I actually claim that Taiwan is the island of Sajiao. Um, I these are this um, I I uh, account um, I say this based on the three um, evidence. First, I think the gender role actually shows um, Sajiao culture is encouraged in Taiwan. Uh, women are expected to be good at Sajiao. And uh, if women feel that they want to be uh, marketable in a marriage market, they probably will actively, actively to learn how to perform those uh, deliberate, cute um, actions. And secondly, in my field work, I think Sajiao performance is prevalent in everyday communication in Taiwan. Um, men and women perform Sajiao all the time, and uh, they they try to use those Sajiao tactics to achieve certain uh, communication challenges or communication problems. And uh, I, I do think I mentioned, you know, the cultural codes of friendliness, friendliness and intimacy plays a significant role in Taiwanese people's worldview and their uh, value. And the third one actually is my argument uh, based on my funding. Um, I think Sajiao culture is growing and the growth of Sajiao culture actually is concurrent with if you observe so movement or localization movement and democratization in Taiwan. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a collective mental state when most of Taiwanese realize that um, they are not Chinese anymore, they are just Taiwanese. And they also witnessed all these um, 
powerless or vulnerable status Taiwan faced nowadays. Um, they are struggling um, in between the superpowers that the United States and the PRC. And that kind of a, a mentality actually influence people's everyday communication. So that is my argument. And I use the political communication as um, my evidence to say, you know, it's not just about interpersonal relationship uh, building, but in general, um, Taiwanese people maybe unconsciously perform a certain cute um, actions, try to persuade uh, each other to accomplish their communication tasks. So one, uh, so so then in my book, I mentioned the um, election in Taiwan. I think um, if you know, uh, in 1998, Chen Shui-bian, uh, during that time, he was the Taipei mayor. He was running for his second term. And he created this uh, Abian Wawa, the Abian doll, uh, for his campaign. I think it's the beginning of uh, cute elements that has been used in Taiwan's election. And he would, he failed for his uh, rerun re for the mayor. However, he um, was elected as the first DPP president in Taiwan. Uh, from 2020, uh, 2000 to 2008. And I'm not saying that uh, those cute elements determine his victory. However, I do think starting from him, we see, I, I think the Sajal performers use those cute elements in their campaigning. So it says something, it works. It, it, it is an effective uh, method. So we, we see a lot of, um, uh, politicians use those elements. And here is an example, like Tsai Ing-wen, the current president, in her first run, like a first, um, the second pre uh, pres presidential election in 2016, she uh, has those piggy banks and the personal fight dolls. These are very cute. And these worked uh, when she tried to um, encouraged her supporters to uh, donate money or support her. However, I want to also mention one point. She, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, is the first female president in Taiwan. And her public image actually is not very feminine, or we would say she seldom play cute uh, in any public settings. We do not see her wearing a skirt uh, she always looked very professional in, in dark suit, right? However, her personal image, she probably choose to be gender neutral as a you know, female leader for Taiwan. However, it does not um, mean that she could avoid those cute uh, use of the cute elements in her campaigning. Her team actually had to uh, use those cute elements to uh, help her shorten the distance between her and the voters. Okay. And the cute trend still continued. We see in 2020, uh, in social media, a lot of visual act artists actually create a lot of uh, cute figures for Tsai Ing-wen. And this one is an example. Uh, the Taiwanese visual artist, Array, created a lot of uh, cute, cutified Tsai Ing-wen icon here, right? All of these figures are Tsai Ing-wen. And uh, um, Tsai Ing-wen tried to promote her policy and to show her achievements in her first first four, four years. And this is a, a promotion for her um, tax reduction policy. Okay, so we, we still see a lot of um, cute elements used in Taiwan's election. And we would like to ask why, right? Uh, I'm not just favoring Tsai Ing-wen. I'm going to show you some um, male politicians, uh, cute elements or cute figures. Here are, here they are, right? There are many. Um, so basically the first one is uh, 
incumbent Taipei mayor Ke Wenzhe and uh, his um, cute icon fi cartoon figure. And the second, in the middle, that is the uh, presidential candidate for 2016 uh, for the DPP party. He has also a cute figure of him. And the third one, everybody probably know, know him, this uh, Ma Ying-jeou, our former president. And I did not know how to call the cute icon in, on, on, in his head, but you, you can tell it's a cute performance. And the, the last one actually is a presidential candidate for 2020. And um, um, he has also those cute icon uh, to represent him. OK. So finally, this is the last slide I want to show you. Um, this is Tsai Ing-wen in her um, first uh, the 2016 uh, campaign and this image was created by one of her young supporters who is also a visual artist and I don't believe it's paid by Thai campaign it's a voluntary work you know and in this young artist's eyes Thai ying wen becomes a teenage superwoman right uh, with cat e cat ears and uh, Tai Ing-wen has two cats, Atai and Xiangxiang. You can see these two cats around her in the other very cute elements in that image, right? So when I showed this picture to an, an American audience, uh, they were shocked that it was created by her supporter. And uh, they reasoned it could be interpreted as, a, as an attack by the opponent to belittle the female candidate if it happened in the United States. OK, one female professor. If I saw myself portrayed this way, I would be so mad. I was so harmless and like a doll. How could people feel flattered when they are cutified this way? So this is a professor's comment on Tsai Ing-wen's cutified image. Hearing her response, I was also pondering, yeah, why don't Taiwanese get mad? Why do Taiwanese people view the cute image as compliment instead of insult? And what, what is the danger of the Sajiao culture? What is the danger of using the cute elements in everyday communication? And that would be some directions for my future uh, project. So I probably would just stop here and I am looking words uh, and the feedbacks and the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.